reading from Acts. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The message spread through Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were who oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death, hanging on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of all the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. A Gospel reading from the 16th chapter of Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and the mother and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices, so that they may go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for, for us when, from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is a place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you, my friends, in the risen Christ. You know, through the eyes of a gospel writer, Mark's point of view would be considered very straightforward, right to the point. You know, he's the first writer to document the gospel, to, t- to tell the good news. But his story doesn't come out until about 35 years after the events that he is describing. His story ends abruptly. There's no disciples that come running. There are no special appearances on the road to Damascus or eating fish by the sea. Those things will happen later and in the other gospel accounts. But Mark's story ends with the women seeing the tomb, seeing that it's empty, and then fleeing in terror. Now, later editors would come along just to make sure that we knew what really happened afterwards. It's almost as if those editors come along because they're like, this gospel of Mark was like the early edition of a newspaper that goes to print before it can have the full story the next morning. Kind of like when Dewey defeats Truman, which didn't actually happen. You know, it's like, this is a story that isn't complete. There isn't the full story the way that Mark tells it, because he wants us to know that the story doesn't just end with the women at the tomb, but it ends with them telling that story, and that it's actually on us to be those messengers. I feel like in the age of instant access to information, whether that's relying on a newspaper or getting notifications on our phones, which might continue to just ping and ping and ping and try to take our attention, we can feel like we're inundated with news. We're inundated with messages. We're inundated with things that want to distract us and catch our attention. 
and it can feel a bit much. But because of that, I think journalists have an important job because they're trying to report the story. They're trying to report it accurately, but they're also trying to report it quickly. And sometimes, and I know I've fallen trap in, uh, fallen into this trap, sometimes I hear the information so quickly that I want to believe that it's true before I've actually proven and read it and known that it's a, a true story. But I would suppose that that's something applicable to almost all of us here. And so how would the story of the resurrection be conveyed if the gospel was reduced to a headline? I think it would really depend on who was writing the headline and what story they wanted you to believe. We know that to be true today. Two people could be telling the exact same story, but convey it in a much different way. For example, if the news about the resurrection of Jesus was reported by, I don't know, the empire, the Caesar Gazette would probably have a headline that read something like, body of dead criminal goes missing, foul play suspected. And I'm sure that this article would tell us all about those suspicious disciples who kept hanging around, watching and waiting and lurking around, but they kept denying that they knew who Jesus was. Or what about the leaders of the temple? You know, the ones who had Jesus arrested for blasphemy in the first place? I'm sure that their local journal would have had a real snarky headline like, Body Snatchers Steal the Son of God in the Sanhedrin Herald. But I do think... If the AP got a hold of this, and once the international uh, news media got a hold of this, you would all of a sudden get some real in-depth reporting. And, and I'm sure that the AP would not want to leave one stone unturned because they would say, you know, of course, Galilee man executed. Three days later, he's alive. Friends say that he is haunting them. And of course, the forensic experts are studying because they want to look inside this tomb and get as much DNA as, DNA as they can to further their investigation. You know, I would probably actually click on that article. I don't know if you would, but I'd be very curious. I would say, that seems really preposterous and crazy. What's going on? But if I read that, would it change my life? Would I read this article and think to myself, wow, this executed man has been killed by the government and he's possibly the savior of the world? It sounds a bit ridiculous when you put it that way. Maybe we think it's crazy now, but I remind you that when it actually happened, people were pretty skeptical then too. There are plenty of doubters, plenty of people, even within Jesus's close circle, who didn't believe that the tomb could be empty, that Jesus could be raised from the dead. People in power wanted to discredit this story. They wanted to deny that it could possibly happen. I think it's in our human nature to be skeptical because we don't want to fall for something. That's why when we read something online, we quick think that this is true. We have to sometimes stop and pause and read the article before we share it and tell everybody some news that isn't actually true. You know, sometimes that happens because of AI or because of bots or people who are looking to spread misinformation. I feel like our collective radar is way up high. We are worried that we are going to do something that's going to spread misinformation. We don't want to be the ones who get tricked or hacked or, or made to look stupid. So I think about the story of the resurrection and how many challenges this has faced over the last 2,000 years. There's been plenty of questions raised. Many skeptics have wondered about it. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, how did this happen? You're not alone. It's okay to ponder at the how, but really it's the why. It's the why that this story matters. It's because of the power and magnitude of the resurrection that this is not just some clickbait story that's going to capture our attention for 30 seconds and then we move on. It's a story that changes our entire lives. It's a story that centers us. And that's why I know this story to be true. Because Easter is one day. It's a very, very important day. But it's a day that actually launches us out into the world to be the apostles, to be the ones to share the good news with the world, with a world that needs to hear good news. It's telling about new life that is won through this empty tomb that raises us up with it. It's a transformational moment for all who hear it. That was the case for Mary and Mary and Salome, those first eyewitnesses. And that was the case for generations to come. You know, the story didn't get documented for speed. It wasn't like, we got to get this story out so everybody can hear it right away. 
It was a story that gets documented so that as those first eyewitnesses died, that people who could hear this story would then believe themselves. New believers would know what Jesus has done. This story has lived on through eyewitnesses who have preached the good news for years to follow all the way to this day with you and me. The resurrection now is the culmination of a life following Jesus Christ, someone who teaches and heals and prepares his followers for what's to come next. We are here because those followers lived out the love of Christ. We are here to hear the story of Mary Magdalene, the woman who remained by Jesus' side throughout, the one who never abandoned him. Whichever gospel uh, writer is telling the story, she is there, ready to prepare the body, ready to be that first evangelist to go share the good news. Why is she there? She's there because of love. We hear about the story of the disciples, especially Peter. And it's fascinating that Peter is such an integral part of this story because the last time we heard from him, he was the one running away in fear, the one denying that he knew who Jesus was, the one who didn't want to end up on a cross like his friend. Yet Peter witnesses the resurrected Jesus. And once he sees that Jesus is alive, he isn't afraid anymore. He has nothing to hide. He preaches the eyewitness account that we heard a few minutes ago in the book of Acts because he can't keep this story a secret. And we hear about Paul, the one who used to go by Saul, the one who persecuted and stood over disciples who were being killed. Yet God even transformed his heart to be filled with the love of Christ, to become an essential evangelist. Here we are. We are the church in 2024. The world around us is changing, yet we change with it. We adapt, we grow, and we learn how to translate how Christ is in our lives in our current context. We are the messengers. This right here, Faith Lutheran, this is a place of love, of grace, of forgiveness. And this is where that love grows and then gets sent out into the world. Because we never forget where it all started. It started in an empty tomb, in a tomb that sprung forth new life and a message that we can't help but repeat. And we say it each and every single year. We come together and remind ourselves of the truth, of the love of Christ, of the good news, the promise of new life. Here's our headline, folks. He is risen. He is risen. Come on, choir. He is risen. Hallelujah. Amen.